All right, so now that we've dealt with real distinct eigenvalues, the next step is to deal with imaginary eigenvalues, aka complex eigenvalues. So what do we do differently? And uh, in order for us to get a solution that makes sense, we need a real valued solution. So how do we get there? OK, so let, let me just present to you the steps of how to do this, and then I'll do an example, and then hopefully it'll make sense. So first things first, you find lambda the same way you always find lambda. You just do determinant a minus lambda i, solve for your characteristic equation. So in this case, you'll find that it's going to be a complex conjugate, right? Because it's still going to be a polynomial that's uh, degree 2, right? Which means that you should have two roots, except they're essentially the same for complex eigenvalues, just plus or minus i beta. So search for your lambdas in the form alpha plus or minus i beta. Cool. Now, this is where it gets different. You plug in only one of your eigenvalues. I say here alpha plus i beta, because that's the one most people will generally take. But you can also take the other one. It should Everything should work out either way. But for the example that I'll do, I'm taking lambda 1 equals alpha plus i beta. And you only find one, one eigenvector, just v. Okay. From there, you split your v into its real and imaginary parts. So an a vector plus i times a b vector. And then you apply Euler's formula to the eigenvector and eigenvalue in order to get something that, or lead up to something that's uh, real valued. So remember, Euler's formula is this. I think I went over it, but just in case. Uh, e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Cool. Then define these new vectors. x1 is equal to the real part of e to the lambda t v which is what we've been doing, right? Um, except we don't do real parts. We just multiply the eigenvector onto the ex exponential of the eigenvalue and then stick on some uh, arbitrary coefficients on them. And then the same thing for x2. Just define it to be the imaginary part of that same uh, e lambda t b. And then finally, your general solution is just c1 x1 plus c2 x2. So the linear combination of those two from step five. Great. OK, let's do this one. So keep in mind, just because it's complex doesn't mean that there's going to be complex uh, numbers in the matrix. It'll be given to you like this. What com how you get complex eigenvalues is the roots of the equation. So great. All right. So what you need to do is what you always do is to solve for your lambdas, right? So let's do determinant a minus lambda i, which means that'll be minus 1 minus lambda minus 4, 1 minus 1 minus lambda, and this will give you minus 1 minus lambda squared plus 4 is equal to 0, and then expanding this out you'll get lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 5 is equal to 0, and then use quadratic formula. So this is negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Right, so this is minus 2 plus or minus 4 minus 4 times a, which is 1, c, which is 5, divided by 2. And that will give you your lambda 1 and 2. So this is really minus 2 plus or minus square root of 4 minus 20 is minus 16 over 2, which is really minus 2 plus or minus 4i, where i is root negative 1, right, over 2 which means that our eigenvalues are minus 1 plus or minus 2i. Great. OK, so step two is to plug this in and only take the alpha plus i beta eigenvalue. So therefore, our a minus lambda 1i times b has to equal 0. And here, I chose lambda 1 to be minus 1 plus 2i. So what does that mean? OK, when I subtract a minus 1, I'm really adding 1. So in the top left component, it'll be 0. And then I want to subtract a 2i. So it'll be minus 2i up here. The second and third components don't change. And then the bottom one is also the same thing. Um, to check if these two rows are the same, right? Or that you could make one of the rows go to 0, 0. 
multiply by complex conjugate onto one of the rows. So on the bottom row, if you multiply by plus 2i, the first component, like this one, would turn into 2i. And then this one would turn into minus 4i squared, which is just 4. So if you multiply this row by 2i, and then this is exactly the negative of that, which means it goes away. So keep that in mind if you want to like move around the imaginary uh, number, I guess, between columns in order to reduce something. So this goes down to, I'm going to keep the bottom row actually because it's a little bit better. 1 minus 2i, 0, 0, which means that v little v1 minus 2i little v2 has to equal 0 which means our eigenvector has to be what? Okay, so let's say, what if little v1 is 2i? That means that v2 just has to be 1, right? So 2i minus 2i is equal to 0, that makes sense. And then remember the other part the step is to split this up into real and imaginary parts. So this is really equal to 0, 1 plus 2i, zero, which I should really just write like that with an I out in the front. So let me erase that. Great. And so this would be my A vector and this would be my B vector. Right? Great. Okay. So now we apply Euler's formula. So we ask ourselves, what is e to the lambda t? So my lambda that I chose here was minus 1 plus 2i. So let me write that down. Minus 1 plus 2i times t. Right? This is really just e to the minus t times e to the 2i t. And now remember, this e to the 2i t is just going to go to per Euler's formula of e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. This is just cosine 2t plus i sine 2t. So this whole expression is just really e to the minus t times cosine 2t plus i sine 2t. All right, great. So now let's try to find our x1, right, which is the real part of this. So keep that up here. Okay. So x1, little x1 of t, is going to be given as the real part of, so it's this thing multiplied onto the eigenvector. So it's e to the minus t times cosine of 2t plus i sine of 2t. All of this multiplied onto our eigenvector. And our eigenvector, if we saw from up above, it's just 0, 1 plus 2, 0, i. Okay, so let's write that down. 0, 1 plus 2, 0, i. Okay. So, I know for a lot of you this might be their first time seeing the real and the imaginary operator. Um, don't worry about it too much. All it means is anything that is real inside of these like squiggly brackets that I've drawn is what we're going to consider, uh, what we're going to pull out of this operator. And anything that's imaginary, so anything that has i attached to it, just goes to zero. We don't care about it. So let's ask ourselves, okay, this is a multiplication of uh, four things, really, right? We can pull out the e to the minus t. e to the minus t is going to stay here regardless because that's real. Um, but now we ask ourselves, I can actually use colors again, I think. We have this red part, this blue part, this green part, and then let's see, do I have more colors? Oh, great. Okay. And this purple part. Okay. You need to ask yourself, what will be real and what will not be real in this case. So think about it. If we multiply this part with this part, so red with green, this is something real, cosine 2t times 0, 1. Everything about this is real, therefore we're going to get something real. So that, that is going to play a role, right? 
And then if we multiply the blue with the purple, i times i is just negative 1, which is real. Therefore, that goes away. So that's our only two contributions for the real part inside this squiggly bracket. Cosine 2t, like say if we did the red times the purple, that'll give us something that's imaginary. So we don't care about that when we're looking at the real operator. We'll care about it later when we're trying to find x2, but let's worry about this first. And then if we look at something like the blue times the green, that'll also give us something imaginary, which we'll look at later. So let's think about it this way. If we now take x1t to be, okay, let's pull out the e minus t because that's not going to do anything times the real component, which means that it's going to be the red times the green and the blue times the purple. So this will be 0, 1 times cosine t means there's going to be a 0 on top of here and then a cosine 2t down here, right? And then if we add the blue and the purple, be careful, i squared is minus 1, right? So we have to subtract it, minus and then we get a 2 sine 2t here, and we get a 0 here. Therefore, x1 of t is really just e to the minus t times, this is going to be a minus 2 sine 2t, and then on the bottom is a cosine of 2t. Great, so that is our x1. Um, and now we want to do something fairly similar for x2. So x2 is pretty much the same thing, except now we deal with the imaginary operator. So this is e to the minus t times, was it cosine 2t plus i sine 2t times Let's put another parentheses here, yeah, 0, was it 0, 1? Yeah, 0, 1, plus 2, 0, i. Yeah, let me put that squiggly, okay. So same thing here, I'll put the same colors as well, so as to not to confuse anyone. We have blue here, we have green here. Then where's my purple? Purple's right here, great. Okay, so how does this work? Pretty much the same thing. You, all you need to do now is think of, okay, what is gonna give me imaginary inside of here? So it looks like if we multiply this real by this imaginary here, that'll give me something that's imaginary. And if we multiply this that's imaginary times this that is real, I'll get something that's imaginary. So that's good. So, therefore, again, and this e to the minus c doesn't do anything because it's real. So anything that's real times real times imaginary is imaginary, and something that's real times imaginary times real will also give you imaginary. So our x2 of t is just e to the minus t times, okay, let's deal with the red times purple. So that would be 2 cosine 2t times 0, or 0 in the second component, and then over here would be a plus. So you don't need to worry about the i squared thing, because there's only one i here, and when you take the imaginary, um, you only care about what's in front of the i, so let me look in the side here real quick. Like, say imaginary of like 7i, this is just 7, it's not 7i, you're looking at whatever's in front of the i. It's the same thing as if you took like the real of like 8 times 1, where 1 is like the i for real, it's like the unit for real numbers, then it's just 8, right? It's not 8 times 1. Well, technically 8 times 1, but we just care about what, what's in front of the unit that determines whether it's real or imaginary. So just keep that in mind. That's why when I go from this step to this one, I can drop the i, because that's the whole point. We want to find real valued solutions. Okay, great. So now the blue times the green that would be 0 up here, and then a sine 2t. Great. Which means that this is now e to the minus t. And then we have a 2 cosine 2t and a sine 2t. Great. 
Okay, and so the final step is to just learn your combination of these two things. So, your final answer is equal to C1 x1 of t plus C2 x2 of t, which is nothing more than just C1 times, okay, let's see, what was our x1? x1 was e to the minus t, and then we had a minus 2 sine 2t cosine 2t plus c2 e to the minus t 2 cosine 2t sine 2t. And that is your final answer. Great. Let me make sure I got my x1 correct, by the way. Minus 2, choo -choo -choo. yeah, okay, great. So yeah, that is how you could write it. Um, I'll make one quick note. If your professor, for some reason, allows you to a crib sheet on your tests, um, there's a formula which you can skip a lot of this. Uh, I don't recommend it just because, like, if you're on a, in a test and you mess up just one part of the formula, there's not really much as a grader that I could do in giving partial credit just because, like, I don't know what exactly you meant to want to write and it doesn't show that you understand everything it just shows that you know to uh, it just shows that you read down the formula incorrectly um, but I'll just give it to you anyway just in case so your x of t can also be written in this form it can be written as c1 e to the alpha t times cosine of beta t times a vector minus sine of beta t times your b vector plus c2 e to the alpha t sine beta t your a vector plus cosine beta t of your b vector where so where I need to find where all these things come from where lambda 1 2 so your eigenvalues is equal to alpha plus or minus i beta so you just plug these things into here, right? And uh, and v is your uh, eigenvector, which is given as a plus i b. And yeah, that's how you could write it. So as soon as you get these two things, your eigenvalue and your eigenvector, you could technically just write down the formula from there. Um, but that doesn't really show me that you know that how you really find these solutions, so be wary of that method. Okay, now we have to talk about face portraits, right? So you might be uh, kind of terrified for these just because they may or may not make too much sense at first, but I've drawn six Cartesian planes on here to show you that this is a very methodical thing, and uh, I think they're probably easier than what we talked about in the last video, so just bear with me. So. First things first, I'm going to denote this first column as alpha is greater than zero. This second column is alpha is less than zero. And this uh, last column is alpha is equivalent to zero. And then I'm going to denote the first row to be clockwise and the second one to be counterclockwise. Okay, so let's talk about this. A lot of what you learned last video is going to translate very well into this video in the sense that if you think of alpha greater than zero, right, that is something that has a real part that's greater than zero. So in the last video when we had something that was greater than zero, an eigenvalue that was greater than zero, it should to be what? It should be unstable, right? So that's probably the case here. So let me write that. We'll probably have something that's unstable here. Alpha less than zero by the same argument. If we get something, if we had eigenvalues that were less than zero, it showed to be asymptotically stable, right? So let's note that. And then alpha equal to zero, it's not stable, asymptotically stable or unstable, so it's just stable. Meaning any small perturbation will make it one of the two, but as it is right now, it's stable. Um, and so keep in mind that this translates down, so this one will also be unstable. This will also be asymptotically stable, and this will be stable. Okay, so what can happen here? 
So think about polar coordinates, think about unit circle. It makes sense that this is probably going to be some sort of like radial uh, spiral or circle looking phase portrait because we have imaginary and so the way that we want to deal with that is in polar coordinates. Um, for this class, don't worry about that. Just know that it, the phase portraits that we get are, uh, what do you call it, circles and spirals, ellipses, that kind of thing. If you want more detail, take the higher level dynamical system courses. Uh, if they're not changed, if their course numbers aren't changed, it's still 45, 41, or 45, 42. And you'll get into more detail on those if you'd like. Um, so, clockwise unstable. That means it's going to spawn away from the origin. It's going to blow up from the origin. The origin is a source, right? And we want it to be clockwise. So it'll probably look something like this, right? Okay. What if it's unstable counterclockwise? Well, same kind of deal. Just kind of looks like that. Okay. Alpha less than zero. Okay, it's gonna get, it's gonna want to go towards the origin. It wants to be asymptotically stable towards the origin, which means that as t approaches infinity, all trajectories and orbits should go to the origin. So that means probably something like this, right? Where the arrow points like this. If it's clockwise, and then if it's counterclockwise, probably something like this, right? And then what about stable? So what's the in between of these? It doesn't go towards the origin, but it's still stable. It's probably a circle. So it just stays on its own little path. And so if we want it to be clockwise, we can do something like this, where the arrows point like that. And then if we want it to be counterclockwise, we can make it like this. And there you go. Those are the six possible face portraits you can have for uh, complex eigenvalues. Um, I'd recommend studying this little table. It'll and hopefully by the, if you do a couple of these problems, you'll see that it, they always fall into one of these six cases, and it's pretty easy to determine which one. So um, watch out for that. Okay, this is pretty important. So you can sketch the phase portrait without knowing the general solution. Like from up above, when we got this general solution of like c1 e minus t minus 2 sine 2t cosine 2t plus c2 e minus t 2 cosine 2t sine 2t, that doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't really tell you how to draw any of this. So all we need are the eigenvalues and because once we get the eigenvalues right we can divide it into uh, which column it's in and then at that point we just need to know is it clockwise or counterclockwise and then we can draw it. right? So let's take a look at our last example. We have minus 1 plus or minus 2i. In this case, we have alpha is less than 0, right? Which means that this must either look like one of the two. It must either look like this, right? When it And it goes towards the origin. Or it must look like this, right? Still going towards the origin. But which one? We need to test for whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise, right? And so... At this point, I would, if I was teaching, I would ask you what, uh, what are your ideas of how we should do this, and this really lies on in your intuition of how well you know this material. Um, so notice something: we're always solving this, right? We're always solving x prime is equal to a times x, which means if you just think about this in words, it means the trajectory is equal to some matrix a multiplied on the position of that vector. So whatever you multiply the, the vector by our matrix A in question will tell you exactly how that vector wants to move from that position. So in order to determine, so to determine clockwise or counterclockwise, just test the E1, E2 vectors. And if you don't remember this from linear algebra, this is 1, 0, and this is 0, 1. So what do I mean by this? So let's take a look at this A. So our the problem that we solved earlier in the video. Let's bring that down here and we'll test these two vectors onto it and see what happens. So A times one zero means that we want to do minus one minus four one minus one onto 1, 0, which means that this will spit out exactly 
minus 1, 1. Okay. Similarly, a0, 1 will give us minus 1, 1, minus 4, minus 1, times 0, 1, which will give us minus 4, minus 1. Notice that these are just the columns of the matrix. So the e1 vector will correspond to the first column, e2 vector will correspond to the second column. And now we use this to draw our face portrait. So remember, we knew it had to be asymptotically stable. We know it has to go towards the origin. We just don't know how it goes towards the origin. We need to know if it's in a clockwise fashion or counterclockwise fashion. So if we draw our face portrait, so let me use my colors again. I'm getting, I'm a big fan of these colors actually. Okay, so this red one means that if we start at one zero, which is here, it tells us that the trajectory is negative one, one, which means it goes to the left one and up one. So it goes like this, right? So we will have an arrow that points kind of like this, up and to the left. Similarly, for the blue one, if we start at zero, one, which is like right here, we have an arrow that points over left four and down one, which is something like this, right? And so now, if we know that our face portrait has to go towards the origin, in what fashion does it have to go? And remember, the arrows are sacred. We have to obey the arrows every time that we do this. Therefore, this has to be counterclockwise in order, if we were to follow these arrows. And there you go. That's the face portrait. So, and just to reiterate. I don't know if I wrote it. Yeah, I didn't write it up here. Let me go ahead and write this. These are called spirals. Spiral, 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 spiral. And these are called centers because they don't spiral. They just sit there and they're kind of like centers. You can also call them circles if you'd like, but centers is the more appropriate term. Therefore, if we want to classify the origin here, we would just say, so this is a counterclockwise uh, counterclockwise trajectory with origin being an asymptotically stable spiral. And this is because alpha is less than zero. And you're done. That's all you really need to know for this. Great. So next section we're going to deal with what if we don't have uh, different eigenvalues? What if they're the same one? How do we deal with not having, not being able to find another eigenvector? Because you only have one eigenvalue, right? So stay tuned for that.